Hello, I'm Dan Humschild, Education Director at Jewish Museum Milwaukee, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to Conversation Starters, where we explore topics relevant to our work here at JMM. Today, I'm joined by Lavi Tithar. Lavi is uh, the World Fantasy Award-winning author whose major works include 2012's Osama, 2016's Central Station, and new this year, Niam. Lavi works across genres, combining detective and thriller modes with poetry, science fiction, and historical uh, autobiographical materials. His work has been compared to that of Philip K. Dick by The Guardian and The Financial Times, and to Kurt Vonnegut's by Locus. Lavi is currently a columnist for The Washington Post, and additional bylines have appeared in The Independent, Nature, SFX, io9, the Vanuatu Daily Post, and others. Uh, Lavi is currently a visiting professor and writer in residence at Richmond, the American International University in London. Lavi, thank you so much for joining me here today. Thanks for having me. Um, good to be here. Wonderful. Now, can you tell us a little bit about your development as an author? What, what sparked your interest in, in telling stories from the beginning? Well, I mean, you know what? I grew up, just to kind of put it into context, I grew up in a kibbutz in Israel, which a lot of people don't know what that is. But, and it's always very difficult to try and explain it to people who don't know what it is. But it's sort of like a Zionist, socialist, utopian commune, you know? Um, and always people go, it sounds a bit like a cult. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a strange environment. I, I was the last generation to come up in a real um, communal way of life. So I was raised, I didn't live with my parents. I lived in sort of the children's house, you know. Um, so from, from, from a baby, really, you, you, there's that kind of separation. But it's a very strange environment to... Uh, to grow up in, in a way. And I think one of the appeals was, you know, going to the library and kind of exploring the wider world because you're very, you're sort of very isolated as well within that little environment. And I think I was always kind of attracted to the weirder stuff, the fantastic, you know, the, um, the stuff that was a bit out of kilter, even from the the children's books, which uh, which which tend to be quite fantastical, and then I discovered science fiction and American science fiction in the in the in the grown up library, you know, um, and I, I think I was quite young. I had to hide the fact that I was reading this like American pop science fiction. You know, it wasn't supposed to be for kids. Of course, now we think it's all for kids. You know that stuff. It, it seems so tame. But I think one of the interesting things for me was the first time I think I discovered Philip K. Dick. And he was almost the only writer who he actually wrote about the kibbutzim. He was really interested in that way of life. And he happens to write these very, you know, these mind blowing science fiction novels, but he sets a kibbutz on Mars and he has Israelis in his books. And I could see myself in those books for the, for the first time reading this because, you know, Science fiction doesn't tend to have Israelis or Jews <laughs> featured prominently. Um, and I think one of the arguments that was made about this, you know, Isaac Asimov famously, I think, said that there's no Jewish characters in the foundation books because they're all Jews in the foundation books, you know, um, which I think maybe the TV adaptations, they kind of miss that fact, you know. Um, so I was always kind of attracted to that stuff, but also I think discovering those works kind of led me to want to write my own versions of, of them, you know. And I think from a very young age, I kind of thought, you know, someone should do this, but for here, you know, someone, someone should do the Israeli science fiction. And I actually, I was going to write, I think, uh, a paper for high school about, you know, Israeli science fiction, and I wrote to the the most important translator in Israel of science fiction, the guy who was really bringing all these books in. And he actually phoned me, or he phoned me at my grandparents, I think at the time. And he, the first thing he said to me was, you need to change the topic of your, of your essay because there's no such thing as Israeli science fiction. You know, and in a way, I think I kind of set out to, to correct that from that point on. I was like, well, if there isn't, I should be, I should be doing something. Um, but you know, because uh, the, because of the circumstances of the way life works out, I kind of ended up in South Africa, 
uh, as a teenager and traveling quite a bit and then ended up in, in England as, as, as an adult. And I think at some point I had to kind of make a decision because I was writing in Hebrew initially and I actually my first book was a Hebrew poetry collection. Um, a rare collector's item that <laughs> still still pops up occasionally, which is really weird whenever someone finds a copy of it. Um, but at some point I had to make a decision of what what language to pursue in a way. And I kind of thought, well, you know, I'm going to try and do it in English. I'm going to try and take on the sort of the big boys in their own game, you know, try and be a small fish in a big pond. Um, but I never actually expected it to work. I think that's what that's what surprised me that somehow making that decision as a long haired teenager in wherever I was, you know, backpacking around um, to actually turn that into a full time career seems insane because, you know, in Israel, we don't really have you don't have full time writers. It's not a profession. And on a kibbutz, they approve of artistic pursuits, but only after you've finished your job in the field or the cow sheds or whatever it is. So. Um, you know, I, I never really consider writing a profession. It just, it's a great surprise to me that it's become a, a career, but that's never the motivation because it just seems so far-fetched that people will pay you to make stuff up, you know? Um, so that's kind of a slight, you know, the short version of how I got into it. Um, on the way, there was a lot of traveling and, you know, um, living around the world, just because I thought if I don't go and travel and live in different places, then I would have nothing to write about. Mm -hmm. And the weird thing was that I think at some point I had a realization, you know, I was living, I think, in South, I was living in the South Pacific, I was living in Southeast Asia uh, for a while, and I was, um, and I had the realization, I, I can write about these places, but only from the perspective of an outsider. And actually, if I go and write about Israel, I can do it from the perspective of someone who actually knows it. And I think that's what led to Central Station, which was the idea of writing a far future science fiction story set in a far future Tel Aviv, Jaffa. Mm -hmm. um, and that, and I, was, I was actually living in Israel, back in Israel at that time. So I got to walk around the real place and kind of experience it. And the, and the spaceport in the center of the story is actually the Tel Aviv Central Bus Station, which is a, a monstrous fortress, you know, it's a, it's a, which again, I saw the plans for it, the original plans, it's this very utopian thing from the sixties, I think, with, with walkways and men wearing hats and the women in dresses and, you know, it looks like, it looks like a science fiction drawing and the reality is this absolutely enormous, cavernous, neglected building that is, that is horrible on so many levels. Um, that has its own nuclear fallout shelter. Supposedly there's a secret Yiddish library hidden somewhere within it um, that's collected thousands of Yiddish manuscripts and books. So an absolutely fascinating place to imagine, in the, you know, to give a futurist, futuristic sort of code to. Um, and that, again, you know, and that was a book that I didn't think anyone would actually publish because I thought, because also I didn't want to write an action adventure Book. I wanted to write a book that would just be about ordinary people living against an extraordinary science fiction background. <laughs> and um, I didn't think anyone would um, would ever publish the book. You know, I was co absolutely convinced that it won't, it won't be published. And once it was published, I was convinced that no one was ever going to read it, <laughs> you know, for, for the reason that nothing happens essentially in the book. Um, and I was very, very surprised. <laughs> It was one of those cases where I just, I was honestly, I had no expectations at all and it far exceeded anything I could imagine. That's amazing. So uh, you mentioned that in uh, in this book, uh, Central Station, and I know Niam is, is of the same of the same world, if I'm not mistaken, right? And uh, you, I wanna just uh, ask a couple questions here. The first is about, the research that you do to go into these books because a lot of people are i think when they imagine science fiction they just imagine purely as you, you might imagine like you know this you couldn't imagine anybody could get paid to just make stuff up right and i think a lot of people when they think of science fiction they think purely of people of writers 
just conjuring things out of their imagination and not grounding it in any way in reality. But um, you just pointed to the fact that Central Station and the world that that comes in is, is out of your experience as an insider, as an Israeli in Tel Aviv, and from a specific location in, in Tel Aviv more, more specifically. So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the historical research that you do to, to create these worlds. And then uh, after that, I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about, about Niam, how, what, what, this, what this new chapter in that, in that uh, story is about. Yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I think it has to be, any story has to be rooted in the real, you know, and it's not even so much, it's even in the smells, you know, that's so important, I think, is how a place smells. It's not something you could ever know unless you've been there, you know, and I think that's really key. Um, I'm fascinated by that whole area, which is the south of Tel Aviv, which started off as, again, you know, I keep using the word utopian, but this sort of Bauhaus, you know, imagine, you know, 1930s German Bauhaus white buildings, you know, things that look like ships and have the, the port windows and all the rest of that. Um, and it was traditionally a very poor neighborhood, or that's the way it became. And um, over the years, or what happened was that you ended up having both the African refugees who've been coming through the desert into Israel from a uh, place like Sudan and Eritrea. And you had all the economic migrants from Asia started coming in the 90s, I think, um, settling there because it was cheap and uh, you know easy to stay. And on the other hand, it was an area that was characterized by Israeli crime. It was, you know, the place where you went to buy drugs and to visit brothels and, and so on. So, um, so I was fascinated by it, you know, because I, so when I was back though, I would walk around, I would kind of take it all in. And for me, it was really just imagining the descendants of the people living there then, that huge mix of people, you know, so you've got your Israelis, you've got your, your Arabs, you've got your, Asians, you've got your Africans, it, it's this huge melting pot, it's quite poor but vibrant, but you know, it has everything going forward, it was kind of trying to just imagine it forward. Um, I think that the most research I had to do, there's a, there's a bris in the book, there's a, there's a robot who's also doubles as the moil for the local community, <laughs> which, which, you know, raises a bunch of interesting um, religious questions whether a robot can be a moil you know where, where does a robot stand in judaism and that was interesting to research as well what are the views on um you know machine intelligence um, in terms of can can a machine be jewish you know um but the the brist which again i, I was sort of inspired because i went to my cousin's i had to go to a brist basically and kind of forgot what they were like you know um, and I thought, yeah, I need to write that. So I had to research, and I think someone said it's the most accurate brisk scene ever written in science fiction. <laughs> very, very specific. Um, so if you know, if I've contributed nothing else to literature, I have contributed an accurate brisk. Um, yeah. Can you, I can you tell us the answer to that uh, about the can can machines be Jewish? I, I want to know the answer to that before we carry on here. I think, firstly, Jews don't agree about anything, so, you know, it depends who you ask. Um, and secondly, I think, the most, I think the best answer I saw, I can't remember who it was, but they said, you know, when you have intelligent robots, ask me then. <laughs> you know, it's like, we can't answer that because it's hypothetical. Sure. You know, if we do get to the situation when we have a robot and the robot wants to convert to Judaism, we'll discuss it. You know, which I think is a, is a very practical Jewish approach to us. Right. We're not saying no, we're not saying yes, you know, let's, let's wait and see. Um, so it does give you quite a lot to, to play with. And, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated. I don't think, I think a lot of science fiction kind of neglects religion. You know, there's the idea that we, as we go into the future, there's less religion. And I don't think that's true. I think if I, we might get new forms of religion, but we're never going to lose that religious impulse. So the worlds that I write are filled with, you know, synagogues and mosques and churches and temples and, um, you know, and I combine 
old religions. And I'm fascinated by the fact that some really old religions are still around that we're not even conscious of. You know, Zoroastrianism is still around, which was the state religion of Persia for for decades, for centuries, for millennia. Um, you know, Judaism is still around, but so are, so are Samaritans, for example. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, you, I don't think we can ever, we can take religion out of the equation. Mm-hmm. And how, uh, I've noticed that in both uh, the setting of Central Station in Yom and in your upbringing, the kibbutz, there's this utopianism that's kind of part baked into some of that, right? That you said that there's this kind of utopian structure and like, uh, I guess, like intention uh, to South Tel Aviv. And in some ways, the kibbutz is itself almost like a utopian, uh, a, a system driven by utopianism in some ways. Uh, can, can you reflect on that and um, any influence that you think that these, like the idea of a utopia uh, or the, whether it's a false uh, pretense or a false like pursuit or not, does that contribute at all to, to your writing or to the way that you think about conjuring these worlds that are in the distant future? Well, yeah, I mean, partly I'm drawn to, you know, I'm drawn to classic American science fiction and that classic science fiction kind of has a lot of cool toys and it has these long futures. And I think, you know, if I if I was writing maybe about what I believe is going to happen, we wouldn't have much of a story. You know, it's like if we, you know, if the human race is doomed, I can't, you can't. So I think one of the interesting things is to take all the shiny toys and say, you know, I'm writing about a future where things do work out. So that's kind of a utopian approach in itself, or at least a hopeful one. But what I found out after I wrote the book that's simply because I took that approach. A lot of people really responded positively to it because so many books say, you know, we are going to die, everything is going to be horrible. And I think it almost takes an act of faith to write a book that says we don't have to do that though. You know, we can get through it. Um, I think where it was a little bit disturbing is where I saw a company in Silicon Valley literally saying, we're going to make the internet the way it appears in this book. The way it appears in Central Station, I thought this was not meant to be taken literally at all. You know, this is me having fun. Let's not let's not confuse the issue. Um, but I think that's still kind of a rare thing. Now, you know, with regards to the utopian impulse, you know, I very much admire my grandparents' generation. They they left their homes. They left a comfortable middle class Jewish existence in Europe. And they moved to another country to live in tents and, you know, break their backs. And they were doing it in pursuit of a dream and an ideology. And they were socialists. And now, did it work out? Not, not really. I don't think, you know, the same if you look at, you know, communism in general. The, the ideals are great. Did it work out? No. So growing up in that, you know, their generation they worshipped Stalin, I believe, back in the day. And when news came about Stalin, they were they were shocked, they were horrified, you know, when when things started coming out of the Soviet Union. So, but I admire that aspiration to a better future. I think that's part of it. But as a realist, I have to write about Wall Street. Yeah, I know these these things. It's not going to work out. So you kind mm-hmm. of try. I don't want to write a dystopia or utopia. I want to write about just a, an ordinary world. And in the ordinary world. We're going to have rich and poor. We're going to have high tech and low tech. Uh, we're going to have all of those things in different places at different times, and they're all intermingled. And I think that kind of adds richness or detail to the yeah. world as well. We're not we're not living in identical futures or that mm-hmm. identical presents. You know. Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about Neon, the new the newest book? Can you tell us a bit about the the main characters. I know it does derive from Central Station, but for those of us who are not familiar with with Central Station, um, can you preview what what they'd expect in Neon? Yeah, it doesn't really derive from Central Station. It's set in the same future history as Central Station, which is something science fiction writers like to do. (laughs) You like to make up this giant historic future history universe and play in it. And it gives you the option to do whatever you want and say it's connected. 
And I've been doing them mostly in short fiction, you know, so most of my short stories are set in this future history. And so it's very easy for me to write a, a passing reference to something. And if you go and hunt it down, you'll find that there's a whole short story about this particular element of that world. Um, so Neom is set in that universe, but other than the fact that it's not that far from Tel Aviv, you know, it's kind of on the Arabian Peninsula, um, you can read them completely independently from each other or in any order, and you, all you'll get is you'll get those linkages throughout the pages, you know, so each one might add a little bit to the other one. Um, but Neon was really came from me discovering this plan, which was a few years ago. So really, it's become quite big news now. But um, that the Saudis wanted to build a futuristic city on the Red Sea called Neon, which uh, which is short for Neon Mostakbal or New Future. So New Future City, you know, very imaginative. <laughs> New Future City. Um, and I was fascinated by it. I thought it was it was such a ludicrous concept. And they had just a marketing video on YouTube with video of the, I think it was the, the, the botanical gardens in Singapore. That was kind of the big futuristic thing. Um, and I thought, you know, I thought that is funny enough for me to, to write to write something about. And I kind of did a short story set in Neon. And um, the other thing is, you know, I, I've, I go to the Red Sea, like over, over the past 20, 25 years, is I, I go to the Sinai, I go to Egypt, never to Saudi Arabia, though, uh, which until recently, I don't think they even allowed Jews into Saudi Arabia. So I would stare across the, the Red Sea to the promised land of Arabia um, and dream of, you know, going, uh, I'd love to visit. And then once the city, once this idea of the city came in, I started imagining what that would look like. And so um, I think what happened was that we had a second lockdown here and I was sort of fine with the first lockdown we had. I was less fine with the second lockdown. It was about this time of year, you know, so it's coming into Christmas, it's winter, it's freezing cold, you can't leave the house. And I was slowly going mad. And um, and I just started writing Neom as a way to escape because Neom is nice and hot and it's far, and, you know. Um, so it's, again, it's not a book that is defined by the plot so much. It's a book about several different characters and the way they interact um, in this futuristic megalopolis. Um, with, I think, some interesting biblical undertones informing the plot without giving any, you know, without spoiling it. Um, but again, it's very much rooted in a sense of place and a sense of time. So, you know, if I'm writing, I think there's a section where one of the characters visits the town of Al-Kisir in Egypt, you know, which again, I did. And that kind of what informs the sights and smells and so on. But Al-Kisir is also an ancient Port town, you know, it's it's a place that was there when the Egyptians, the Phoenicians, everyone else was going around. So I think it's interesting to write about the Middle East and Arabia and all that because you have that constant sense of history underneath it. You know that you can build the shiny future, but the shiny future is built on layers and layers and layers of history, which are still there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very interesting. It almost seems like the whatever. Um, future you imagine must always take into account those layers and layers of history and and in some ways there seems to be there always seems to me when I look at these sorts of histories there seems to be some kind of cyclical nature of it which I imagine also plays out as you're saying you know biblical references playing out in the distant future right and not not the absence of religion but kind of the continuation of it in one form or another uh, I've noticed in this conversation and in talking to you in the past that there's just sort of a wry smile that you have when you're talking about your work. It seems that humor, you mentioned humor, that uh, this, this book, Neon, was almost initiated by some kind of comedic uh, impulse by this, you know, uh, by this uh, imagined city, by the Saudi government. How does, how does humor and comedy in particular drive you or play into your work? You know, that's a really good question, which I've never, no one ever responds to that. But I think it's, well, I take my work very seriously. Right? I think my, my agent is always confused by it, because he's like, your work, like, you know, as a person, he says, you're a very unserious person. He's like, I can't take you 
seriously at all. But then you hand me these books and he says, how did this person write that book? You know, it drives him insane. Um, I don't think you can take yourself too seriously. But I think in a way, you know, chasing the joke, because jokes, humor is a way of highlighting the world as it really is. You know, and one of the things I'm fascinated by is Holocaust humor. You know, having grown up in Israel with Holocaust surviving grandparents and so on, um, the Jewish inclination is to make fun. Not to make fun of the Holocaust, but to trans transmute pain into laughter, I think is what it is. And, um, you know, I did a book called A Man Lies Dreaming, which is mm -hmm. a very serious book about the Holocaust. And Adolf. it's basically about Adolf Hitler as a private detective where he never came to power. And the whole thing is being dreamt by um, a pulp, a Yiddish pulp writer in Auschwitz. You know, so it's a very dark book, but it's a very funny book at the same time, especially, I think, if if you're Jewish, because it, it attempts to take that horrible, you know, the horror that we can't even articulate and translate it in some way. And, you know, I was researching things like the humor, the jokes that people were actually telling in the death camps. You know, and it's very, very dark, very dark humans, gallows humor, but people were still telling jokes, mm -hmm. even as they were going to their death. So, you know, I think that's really the only way you can maybe write. You have to be aware of the absurdity of, of what you're writing about, um, even when it's serious. The only place where I made, I kind of took a step back from that. Um, is I did a, I mentioned earlier when we were talking, um, I have a literary novel that's just come out in the UK called Moral, you know, from the Passover, you know, bitterness. And it's about 40, 40 years of Israeli history, the sort of the, the dark underbelly of Israeli society, you know, all based on real historical events and people and really amazing amazing research that stuff I never imagined or knew about kind of comes to life through looking at all old newspapers and just digging through the archives. But I thought, you know, I'm trying to do a literary novel. So I'm going to dial down on the jokes. <laughs> I'm gonna dial down on, it, on the humor because I think they don't, I think as, as powerful as I think humor, humor is, I think people may, you know, there's that thing about they always give the Oscar for a drama and never do a comedy, and comedy is actually harder. Mm -hmm. So for me, and I mean, I think you, you know, you're doing Jews in Space, and thinking about Mel Brooks's, you know, when he does the, the History of the World Part Two, Jews in Space, you know, that's that was an inspiration not just for me but for like a whole generation of writers from my sort of background that this was the first time we started it was a joke it was a throwaway joke at the end of the movie mm -hmm. um but what a powerful joke you know mm -hmm. so i you know i'd much rather do the stuff that's funny because i think the fun is where the truth is you mm -hmm. know and i'm a bit I, you know i'm inspired by stand-up comedians because they will go to any length for the sake of of a joke and that's kind of I will go you know again Adolf Hitler as a private detective is an incredibly offensive concept if anyone else had tried to do it I would be horrified and I think I just about got away with doing it you know I could I I had the moral authority to maybe get away with it you know sure. um but yeah and I think science fiction kind of lends itself to the structure of a joke you know because it is kind of springing something unexpected on you mm -hmm. if that makes yeah. sense absolutely yeah and you mentioned um in in some of your other work elsewhere that i mean in, in addition to humor being kind of embedded in jewish identity and jewish ways of navigating the world that actually science fiction is kind of something that comes out of the jewish world and that the that science fiction itself owes a great debt to to Jewish authors and, and Jewish writers. Can you uh, unfurl a little bit for us the history of um, the, the Jewish influence on science history for us? You know, it's a really interesting question because it's not something I've ever really been able to figure out because it's not universal either, you know. Um, if you think about, say, the formation of the state of Israel, it sort of emerges out of Theodore Herzl's dream of 
you know, a Jewish state. And him writing a novel called Alt Neuland that kind of imagines that Jewish state. So we have this novel written before there is a state, you know, and again, his novel is a utopia. The result isn't exactly a utopia. You know, he gets, um, and, and the worst thing is, again, his family, he dies before he ever gets to see it. His family dies in the Holocaust, you know, before they ever get to, to see it. Um, and then what happens in the Israeli context is that Israeli literature is completely opposed to any idea of the speculative, the fantastical, um, that was simply not a thing you did at all. So Israeli fiction is very much about the here and now, about so-called realist fiction. You know, even though I, did, I kind of, I disagree with the fact that it's realist fiction because I think it's, a lot of it is almost fiction in service of the state um, in a way. But what happens in America on the other hand is that those same, descendants of the same people, you know, the, the sort of the American Jewish writers seem drawn to science fiction in a much larger percentage than the overall population would suggest, you know. Um, and again, I've never quite been able to um, articulate why necessarily that was. I mean, even the guy who gave us the, the words, you know, the term science fiction was a guy called uh, Hugo Gernsback. Um, and his real name or his original name was Hugo Gernsbacher. And he was like, I, th I think he was the only Jew to ever come from Luxembourg. I've never figured out <laughs> why there were, but he emigrated from Luxembourg to America, changed his name to Gernsberg and published the first science fiction magazine. And again, you, you know, and he was, he was a crazy inventor and uh, um, his non-Jewish writers, you know, were quite anti-Semitic about him and called him you know, Hugo the Rat and, and so on. Um, but I've never really understood why, why, you know, American Jews, yes, Israeli Jews, no. So how do you explain that dichotomy? I don't know. But, mm -hmm. and again, when, when Jews were writing science fiction, they weren't writing about Jewish characters so much. I think there's a little bit in Silverberg and I think, you know, Asimov, his characters are very Jewish. But we don't really get any explicit Jewish Jews in space. We don't get explicit Jews in space. And to be honest, I still struggle with how that would work. And I think maybe because we can't take it very seriously. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. what would they? What would we do in space? Um, so there's there's some stuff, but again, it often turns it tends to the humorous, you know. I recently fell in love with um, a friend of mine discovered a book about a Shadchan from like the 1920s. And it's written in almost like a hard boiled style, you know, but instead of solving crime, he's just matching people. <laughs> and I thought that was wonderful. And I kind of just write a pastiche of it, but he's on Venus and he has to match all these weird alien people. <laughs> Um, you know, so imagine a Venus populated by Jews and aliens and there's a Shadchan. And I thought that was hilarious, but it's not a very serious examination of, you know, what would we, what would we be like in space? I don't know. I think maybe the same inclination to humor is also what prevents you from taking it too seriously. And I think you mm -hmm. kind of do need to be, you need a degree of seriousness mm -hmm. to make it convincing. So... It's a mystery to me. Uh, do you do you have any idea? I'm not sure. I think I mean, if if uh, one thing that came to me uh, as you were talking is this idea that blessed is the one who's in on the joke in some ways that like and both science fiction, which is imagining distant futures and, you know, just general humor has to take this global, this global or universal perspective in some ways. Right. To be to be to have gallows humor, as you talked about, or to write about the distant future when who knows what's gonna happen. Um, we One has to be in on the joke and the joke being that we exist at all in the first place, right? And there's there's something about about that that is seemingly embedded in, in uh, partly what it, what it means to remain uh, a member of the community. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. It's also, you know, I think Judaism doesn't lend itself very well to fantasy. Now, I might get into trouble if there's any Jewish fantasy writers out there. But it's because, you know, the successful sort of, the successful 
fantasy as we think of it in the 20th, 21st century form, you know, the C.S. Lewis, the J.R. Tolkien, the um, uh, J.K. Rowling, and so on, they're, they're Christian texts, you know, they're about good versus evil, um, they have that underpinning of the faith, and weirdly, the underpinning of World War II as well. So, you know, Harry Potter is all about fighting, Jesus fighting Hitler, essentially, I think is mm. the, uh, but Judaism doesn't have that. It doesn't deal in absolutes, you know, there's no, the devil isn't the bad guy, he's just the opponent that God, God kind of lets him be the bad guy, you know, he's not a real bad guy. Uh, we don't really have a hell, we don't, you know, so the, so how do, you know, we, we exist in sort of moral relativism in a way, um, mm. which doesn't lend itself to the type of fantasy that's become so successful. So that's another thing that is kind of a, an interesting challenge, I think, is how do you write Jewish fantasy in a way that makes it interesting? Not to mention, you know, that Jewish mythology includes, which I was shocked to discover, someone had to point it out to me, that our demons have chicken feet. I mean, I mean, you know, no one can take that seriously. It's, it's just spoiled the whole. Once you introduce demon with chicken feet, it's kind of you lost me. I'm sorry. It's like someone needed to do a better job there on the the whole demonology element. So it's interesting. I think I think when people do engage with it, um, there can be some interesting stuff. My friend Shimon Adaf, who is a fantastic um, Israeli novelist, he has been writing books with a real Jewish cosmology. And of course, he's incredibly well read and researched in Jewish tradition. So he knows a lot more than I do about it. Um, but I'm still not sure, you know, I'm still not sure what shape that could take. Mm -hmm. I think it's it probably left to someone wiser than me to figure that one out. <laughs> Well, maybe we can leave that as the as the prompt, as the prod for those of us, for those who are listening to go figure it out. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, the other thing we have is the golem, you know, and every time, every time Jewish mythology or Jewish fantasy, you know, is brought up, everyone goes a golem, a golem, you know, we've got a golem and a deer book. I mean, what are you going to do with those guys? There's, you know, you can, yeah, but I don't think, I don't think we have the, we don't, you know, original sin and all the things that are so important, you know, the Messiah thing. I don't think we really have it in a compelling way to make that kind of fantasy that makes Harry Potter or Narnia or Lord of the Rings work. Mm -hmm. I think, too, so much of that is about individual, the individual and individual salvation or whatever it might be, which is also not a foundational element within Jewish religion or Jewish faith. It's not about the individual so much as it is about the community, right? And fantasy is so distinctly founded on, you know, whether it's uh, Harry Potter or, uh, you know, Frodo, there, there's these like singular characters who are pursuing something that ultimately is where they become sort of a savior, but they're, they're doing it on their own rather than like as a member of a community. I mean, there is the argument, I mean, we're getting a bit of, sorry, but there, there is the argument that the hobbits are the Jews of, you know, the of Middle Earth. Um, yeah, I don't, know. <laughs> I don't know. But also, I mean, if you think about, you know, the requirements, like if you're Christian, you can kind of, or if you're Catholic, you can confess your sins and you can go to heaven. And if you're Jewish, they kind of say, well, you know, try and be good. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> try and be good. Like, try and follow these mitzvahs, you know. Mm -hmm. it, it lacks a certain gravitas <laughs> try and be good what happens if I'm not good eh, not much to be honest not like you're going to go to hell for you know 10,000 years just just make an effort um, and I think because as you said I think Judaism is so much more focused on the here and now on the world we live in rather than on the next world on, well, it is about living in the present so i don't know i honestly don't know why it's attracted the writers it's attracted over the years certainly some of the big names have been jewish um and again you know things like superman or spider-man or all the all the superheroes all the classic superheroes were really created by um second generation um jewish american kids you know very much i think as a metaphor for 
um, you know, for immigration and passing. Superman is the classic example that he's, I mean, he's so clearly a metaphor for being Jewish in America, you know, that he's, mm -hmm. he's an alien who's using this ridiculous Anglo name to, to pass, you know, Clark Kent. And I did, I did write a book about um, superheroes, which is why I'm kind of bringing this up. I did a book called The Violent Century, which very much treats it as a very serious topic and how sure. that would actually work. And I think one of the, maybe the problems I have with that is that there were so specifically Jewish characters and they were so specifically set against that background of the Holocaust and World War II happening um, that I think most of the modern adaptations kind of moved away from that now. It's kind of, they've been invent, reinvented. Mm -hmm. And I think there's actually something really interesting and almost profound about the way these ridiculous characters you know, again, emerge from a moment of emotional truth, you know, from a core of this great fear and uncertainty about the place of the Jews. Mm -hmm. um, so I did do, I did do a book about it. Um, but again, you know, I did a book about, because I don't like superheroes in particular, so I thought I'll write a book about superheroes, um, which is a terrible sort of approach to writing books, because whenever I don't like something, I'll write a book about it. And of course, the people who do like it, you know, if people who like superheroes aren't going to pick up a book by a guy who doesn't like superheroes. And people who don't like superheroes aren't going to pick up a book about superheroes. So it's a terrible kind of system that I've got. So, you know, I did a book about King Arthur because I can't stand the whole King Arthur mythology. So I did, <laughs> well, I'll do a book that skewers the whole thing and it kind of leads to the same trap. So, so I need to figure out a better system. Find out, I need to write about things people like. <laughs> well, one thing is certain is that you are quite prolific. So when people uh, hear this and they want to find out information about you and, and find out more about your writing, where should they go? Where can you direct them? To find out uh, more about you? Well, just, you know, Google my name. Uh, go to a bookshop. Now, um, I'm on Twitter as Leviti Dho. Mm -hmm. um, Twitter is still around, apparently. Hasn't collapsed just yet. Uh, my website is levitidor.wordpress.com. So as you can see, I don't invest a huge amount of effort in it. It's just a place to remind me of how many books I've written, basically, <laughs> uh, which is so many. But um, yeah, ideally just, you know, any bookshop um, and see the, 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 latest, the latest books. So I think the latest book is Neon, as we said, in, at least in the States. Um, and I also have a book called The Best of All, the Seth, Volume 1 and 2, uh, which is a series of huge sort of hardcover books that I've been editing that collect the best science fiction from around the world. So writers from nearly every country and every continent and so on. So that's been kind of a fun thing to do. Um, it's taken me a long time to convince anyone to let me do those books. <laughs> I'm very lucky to finally get the opportunity to do them. Wonderful. Well, be sure to go check those things out. And uh, I want to thank you again, Lavi, for being here with me today. Thanks to all of you for watching. And uh, join us again next time for Conversation Starters. Bye-bye. Thanks for having me.